Hi there, I'm Tony Felzone. I'm part of the Center for Internet and Society on behalf of CAS. I want to welcome you. I'm going to make this presentation really short, uh, in part because there's just a lot to say. Uh, I don't think I can do much of an introduction to this crowd. Um, he is, of course, the founder and the chief evangelist of the free software movement. There are probably few people in the world who have thought more carefully about the development of digital technology. He's here to talk to us today about digital inclusion, what makes it good or bad, um, and perhaps most importantly, explore whether we're able to support the good. So please welcome Richard Stallman. So I'd like you to ask questions at the end, please. Because uh, I'm going to say a lot of controversial stuff. And uh, I need to say a little bit about a point before it's likely to be at all clear. And I'd rather not have to defend a half-stated point. <clears throat> so we see a lot of efforts for the sake of digital inclusion which presume that to be using the internet is good. Well, I don't necessarily agree. I think that using the internet is good if it gives us practical advantages and doesn't take away the freedoms that we used to have. But if it does take them away, then it's bad. And freedom is greatly threatened in a number of different ways in the internet. I'm going to talk about a number of different ways in which the internet and computers threaten our freedom and therefore things that, uh, you know, threats we need to block and defend against in order for digital inclusion to be a desirable goal. First, there is surveillance. Digital technology is Stalin's dream. It makes possible surveillance at a level that was never possible before, especially if those dangerous ideas such as pervasive computing become real. If all the things we have have computers, who are those computers going to report to? Do you think, who is going to control them? Do you think you will control the computers in the objects that you own? Or will they be set up to control you? Surveillance is pervasive already in digital technology. Uh, I was using a, uh, a surveillance and tracking device to make a phone call. How many of you carry a surveillance and tracking device? Well, I'm glad to see some who don't. I don't. I refuse on principle. A portable phone would be extremely convenient for me. But I feel it's my duty to refuse to carry a portable surveillance and tracking device. Now, they track your, motion, your movements wherever you go. The phone is recording it and telling a company that puts this in a permanent database. And under the, so, under the Pat Riot Act, the Big Brothers men can collect that data without even an ordinary court order that they'd have to get to uh, collect da data from your home. But they can collect all that information about you without one. So it's very dangerous. But we also see surveillance going on in other ways. For instance, if you use the uh, electronic toll payment systems, they track you. And not just when you pay toll. There are other, uh, there are other transmitters that detect when people are passing, even though they don't charge toll. And uh, that it doesn't need to be that way. Systems which pay anonymously were built, were offered for sale, but they prefer to surveil people. You shouldn't use those systems. It's your duty to refuse them. And in many subway systems, they offer you passes with uh, RFIDs. And if you get one of those and it's connected with your name, then they're tracking you all the time. So you've got to make sure that 
if you use one of those that you pay always in cash, no exceptions, and that you swap them and, or change them frequently. <clears throat> but it can get even worse in the UK all car travel is tracked by cameras that recognize license plates. They know where every car is in the whole country. This is a massive system of surveillance. Now, of course, they say that surveillance will help them catch the standard boogeymen. But really, government surveillance is more dangerous than those standard boogeymen. The UK's car travel tracking system has already been used to sabotage peaceful protest. And we know that the police all around the world do not respect the human rights of people who are criticizing the government. That they will, and that court systems will prosecute people for the tiniest of things if they're protesting while winking at grave crimes, even manslaughter, by the police. We can compare the relative danger of, for instance, terrorists and states if we look at uh, the example of the US. Terrorists killed a little under 3,000 people in the US in September 2001. Now, we don't know, because there was never a real investigation, whether those terrorists were working in some way with the Bush regime. I have signed a petition calling for a proper investigation of this, of what really was behind those attacks and what happened. Because we don't know until there is a proper investigation. But let's assume that that wasn't the responsibility of the Bush regime. We know that the invasion of Iraq was the responsibility of the Bush regime, and that crime killed around 4,500 Americans and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. So even if you decide Iraqis don't matter, still, who killed more Americans? It was Bush. And you can reproduce this around the world. So <clears throat> we do need to be very concerned about anything that enables the police to have more power over dissidents. And surveillance is exactly what does it. Now, surveillance can even be done through our own computers, often they have spyware features designed to send information. We know of spyware features in Microsoft Windows uh, and in many countries ISPs are required to record what internet sites people connect to and keep that information in case the police want it later. So what happens if uh, there's a military coup and uh, people realize that they better be careful who they talk to on the phone. Well, it's too late if the phone system has years worth of past data. Uh, the, uh, the new dictator's men can look at that data and find out who knows whom. And that way, if they see this person's a dissident, they look at whoever uh, he used to call on the phone, and they figure they're probably dissidents too. And it's too late to take precautions once the dictator comes into power because the records are already there from the past waiting just in case. <clears throat> now, in a free society, you're not guaranteed anonymity for what you do in public. When you walk along the street, it's always possible someone will recognize you. And that person might remember having seen you there. But this is diffuse information. To collect this information in order to track somebody's movements is a big job, so it's not done very much. 
It's only done very rarely when it's worth a lot of trouble. But the electronic surveillance that we're now exposed to produces compact, convenient databases in which all sorts of information about each person is conveniently available. And there's a world of difference between these two. I've been subscribing to magazines since I was a teenager, but I'm now starting to wonder if I really should do that anymore. In the, in the 1970s, there was no reason not to. Nobody knew uh, except the magazine who I was, what magazines I was subscribing to, and that didn't bother me. But now I suspect that information is all conveniently available to anyone who's trying to track all our lives. If he has sufficient uh, connections with the state. The next threat I want to mention is censorship. We used to think that the internet enable, would help people communicate and would be and would tend to defeat censorship. But now we see censorship of internet access spreading beyond the countries that we know are dictatorships to others that claim not to be, such as France and Spain and Italy. More and more they're establishing censorship, filtering of the internet, of, of internet access outside the country, and schemes to arbitrarily close websites without even a trial. In other words, attacking the most basic human rights. And if we allow internet communication to largely replace paper communication, we may find that this means a grave setback for human rights. Spain's recent law allows a ministry to order the closure of any server in Spain, and also to order the filtering, the blockage of access to any server outside Spain that they believe is aimed at people in Spain. And this, again, this censorship is without any kind of trial. Denmark has long blocked access to a list of websites which is secret. The first rule of censorship is you don't talk about censorship. They don't want people to know just how much their freedom has been curtailed. This list was leaked and posted on WikiLeaks. So that WikiLeaks page was added to the list. Australia doesn't have filtering, but it has censorship of links. Electronic Frontiers Australia was ordered to remove a link to a foreign political website on pain of a fine of $11,000 a day. So that's what political censorship does in Australia. I believe the motive for that censorship was that there were some pictures on that website that looked sort of gruesome. Well, is that a justification for political censorship? Can a people be said to be free when their political reading is censored in that way? <clears throat> and we see similar plans in the United States. Congress is considering a bill called COICA, which plans to give uh, some uh, government agency the power to cancel domain names and other powers as well. Uh, I think punishing ISPs that uh, have some sort of links to them, I don't remember the precise details anymore. Uh, so our freedom is threatened here too. <clears throat> the next threat I wanted to mention comes from data formats that 
attack the user community. There are two ways that they can do this. One is if they're secret and the other is if they're patented. A large amount of distribution of audio and video is done in secret formats. For instance, there's a site called Hulu that I've never seen, but you might have, uh, which distributes in secret formats. And a law pioneered by the US prohibits the distribution of any free software capable of handling those formats. Italian public television distributes using a secret format. It's called VC1. It's an official standard which is secret. Get that. It's supposedly a standard, and yet people can only get a copy of the standard with a non-disclosure agreement. And you have a government-funded agency, the only one in its country, distributing to the public in this secret format. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if PBS distributed in a secret format, too, I, but I don't know. It would be interesting for somebody to check. <clears throat> so secret formats are one of the problems. The other is when they're patented. And the reason is that when a format is patented, that restricts the development of players. And that also attacks the people who might want to look at, the, at those work, published works. Published works without, before the digital age were published in formats like this one, which were not secret at all, and which didn't require you to use anybody's proprietary technology in order to appreciate the contents. But that may disappear if we don't fight to protect it. The next threat to freedom in a digital society comes from software that the users do not control. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. If the users have sufficient freedom in their use of the program, then the users control the program. But if the users don't have sufficient freedom to effectively have control of the program, then the program controls them. The first case we call free software. The second case we call proprietary software. So this, in a nutshell, is why proprietary software is an injustice because it's software that subjects the users to the control of the program. And the program, of course, is controlled by somebody. And that somebody has power over the users. The program is simply an instrument of his power over them. The four freedoms that you need in order to control, in, that the users need in order to effectively control the program and control the computing they do with it are the definition of free software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. There are proprietary programs that won't even let you do that. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it so the program does your computing as you wish. Now, this means that if somebody put malicious fe features into the program, the users can see them and remove them. But it also means that the developer knows the users can do that. And that's a great deterrent. So most of the time, the users don't even have anything nasty to remove, because the developer knew that, they, that the users would be able to spot it and remove it. And that makes it a lot less tempting to use the program to abuse the users. Free software is the only known defense against malicious features in software. 
<clears throat> and this defense protects all the users, including the ones that don't know how to program and couldn't study or change the software personally themselves. They still get the benefit of the fact that they're part of a community that has a defense. Freedom two is the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program to others when you wish. And that includes giving them away and selling them because free software is free as in freedom. We're not talking about price. We're not saying it's supposed to be gratis. We're not saying anything about price, actually. We're only talking about freedom. Price is just a commercial detail. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions, if you wish. And this is what makes it possible for, to, to improve a free program once and then make that improvement available to all the users. Without Freedom 3, yes, we'd each be free to improve the program, but each of us would have to do it. We'd have to write the same change millions of times. What a waste. And the non-programmer users, they don't know how to write the change. They can't write it for themselves. So freedom three is really crucial for them because this way if a few people make an improved version they can release that if they wish and then everybody can use it if she wishes including all the non-programmers. So this way we can and we very often do contribute to our community. <clears throat> so if we're using free software, then by and large the software is under our control and it's doing what we want. But if we are using non-free software, that means the program is under the control of somebody other than us. And that somebody faces the constant, uh, tremendous temptation to use that power over us to make that program control us in some nasty way. I've already told you about surveillance features that are found in Windows and many other proprietary programs. <clears throat> so this is why non-free software is an injustice and a denial of freedom. And to live in freedom, we simply need to reject it. And that's why I started 27 years ago working on, well, organizing the development of a full spectrum of free software to make it easy for all of you to escape from non-free software. <clears throat> so we're not just writing some fun programs that are useful. We're aiming to make possible a world in which we have freedom. And we've done it to a large degree. In 1983 when I started, if you wanted to use a computer without proprietary software, you were going to have to write a lot of software first, like the whole operating system. But now that's done. Now, if you want to escape from proprietary software, you don't have to write anything. You just have to go to the trouble of switching and accept an occasional inconvenience. But you know, if you won't accept an inconvenience for, your, for the sake of your freedom, that means you don't value freedom very much. Freedom sometimes requires, demands a sacrifice. And if you won't make any sacrifice to keep your freedom, that says you don't value freedom. And people who don't value freedom, they're going to lose it. The next threat to our freedom in a digital society comes from losing control of our computing by doing it on someone else's server. In other words, software as a service. And I think I've got more, yes. That's what this button is about. Don't SaaS me. Well, SaaS means software as a service. 
And that means that instead of doing your computing on your own computer, you send all the relevant data to somebody else's server and the computing's done there. And what does that mean? It means he controls your computing and you don't. It's impossible for you to have control over your computing if it's done by his copies of various programs that you can't see, can't touch. Obviously, you can't change them. And why should you be allowed to change the software running on his server? He ought to have control over that. He deserves to have control over what goes on in his computer. But that means you, as one of the many users of his server, you don't have control over the computing it's doing for you. And that's why this is bad for your freedom. So how do you avoid this? You do your computing with your copy of a free program. Not with his copy of any program, because he controls that and you don't, but with your copy. Now, software as a service is a rare thing. If we look at all the world's network servers, which are mostly web servers, uh, almost all of them are just publishing information for you to look at. There's n that's not doing your computing. So there's no reason you shouldn't use this information. But let's look at the ones that provide a non-trivial service. Well, most of the time that service is not doing your computing. It's mostly doing some kind of communication or publishing things for you, or it's a collaborative project. Wikipedia is a good example of that. If you edit a Wikipedia page, you're not doing your computing. You're helping Wikipedia do its computing. So it's appropriate that Wikipedia have control over that, which it does since it operates its servers with free software, so everything's OK. There's no reason why you would expect to have control over Wikipedia's computing, and you don't. Wikipedia should have that control, and it does. But that still leaves a few services which are software as a service. The clearest example is Google Docs. Google Docs invites people to do their word processing and spreadsheets not on their own computer for which there's perfectly fine free software, but instead on Google's computer, which means handing over c control of their own computing to Google. Well, I don't care whether it's Google or somebody else. The point is, if you hand over the control to somebody who runs a server, you lose control yourself. So software as a service means losing control of your computing and you shouldn't use it. It also, by the way, has the byproduct of surveillance because in order to have your computing done on your data in somebody else's server, you've got to send your data to that server, which means it's the same as if it, it's the same as using a program which is spyware and sends some of your data to a server. It's the same in the sense that Either way, there's a server that ends up with your data, and how do you know what it's going to do with it? Can you be sure it won't give that data to Big Brother? Or even to somebody else not quite as dangerous as Big Brother, but perhaps annoying? And that's the next issue. If you store your data in some place other than your own computer, if you give it to somebody other, that's other than yourself, what's going to happen to it? We are constantly invited to store our data in servers, servers that are not under our control, that are run by companies that we know we can't trust, even to be honest with us. Uh, let alone to never make mistakes. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Whenever you see someone use the term, quote, cloud computing, unquote, recognize that it's a snow job. It's a nebulous term. 
which includes lots of different ways of using the internet. And some of them are bad, and some of them are okay. But as, if somebody is trying to be so vague as to use that term, then it's a snow job, and you should refuse to carry on the conversation in such vague terms. There's a tremendous difference between software as a service and a backup service where you send encrypted data that they can't understand and a co-location facility where you rent a server. These are totally different uses of the internet. And those people who don't want you to think about what you're doing like to call them all cloud computing so that you'll get a nice, warm feeling and not think. The next threat to our freedom in cyberspace comes from the war on sharing. Sharing is good. And one of the tremendous benefits of digital technology is to make it possible to share copies of published works. This is a tremendous gift to humanity that we should take full advantage of. However, there are people who profit from having a lock on copying. And they don't want humanity to receive this tremendous boon. So they are trying to take it away from us. They are tr trying to attack sharing, which means, in effect, to attack society. And they do this in a number of ways. First of all, they passed laws forbidding sharing, more or less. Uh, those laws are obviously fundamentally evil because sharing is good. And anything that attacks sharing attacks the bonds of society, the social cooperation that we all depend on in all areas of our lives. And I should clarify, by sharing, I mean non-commercial redistribution of exact copies of published works. Now, there are certain kinds of works for which I believe additional freedom is called for. For instance, software should always give you the four essential freedoms. Software should always be free. And likewise, the other works that we use to do practical jobs, such as reference works and educational works and text fonts and various other things uh, that you use to do a job. But there are other kinds of works, like art, entertainment, opinion, which contribute to society in different ways. They're not to be used to do a practical job. They, make, they have other kinds of value. And for those, I don't say that they need to be free. But the freedom to share has to apply to all works, because sharing creates the bonds of society. And it's useful and good for all kinds of works. Now, just prohibiting sharing didn't work. So they tried using propaganda terms like pirate. When people say that sharing, that people who share are pirates, they want us to assume that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. Now, Morally speaking, you can't get more wrong than that, because attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So we shouldn't call them by the same name. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> because I refuse to apply the same word, piracy, to sharing, which is good. And you should refuse, too. When people ask me what I think of music piracy, I say, from what I've read, when pirates attack, they don't do it by playing instruments loud and very bad. Instead, they use arms. So the point is, look for ways to pointedly reject those propaganda terms. <clears throat> And another propaganda term that they use is theft.
because legally speaking, copyright infringement, which sharing might perhaps be, is not theft. Never. It's never theft. Whether Sometimes it's a crime, sometimes it's not, but it's never theft. So they moved on. They started publishing things in secret formats for the specific purpose of restricting the public. We saw this for the first time in DVDs. The movie in a DVD can be encrypted, and the encryption format was secret for the specific purpose of restricting the viewers. The DVD conspiracy said that anyone that wanted to manufacture DVD players had to join the conspiracy and promise to restrict the public, promise to build the DVD players so they would restrict the users, just like all the other DVD players. <clears throat> and that's why they all restrict the public the same, why on the most important thing there's no competition effectively. And then uh, somebody figured out the secret encryption format and released a free program capable of decrypting it. So it was possible if you bought a DVD to watch it using free software. So the US passed a law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, banning distribution of such software. And then the same companies that purchased that law managed to procure laws in the European Union and uh, various other countries as well, banning this free software because it's useful to enable people to do something in freedom instead of in shackles. So uh, that didn't work though. People keep distributing this software. So they developed an, another form of digital restrictions management, DRM, that's what this is called, uh, called AACS. And the AACS conspiracy is very aware of how much power it has. For instance, as of, it's either this year or 2013, I can't remember, uh, analog video outputs are banned by the AACS conspiracy. Now, you might ask how I know about these conspiracies. I'm not an investigator. If they were secret, I wouldn't know how to find out about them. But the companies that started these conspiracies are so aware that the government is on their side against us that they don't even bother to hide their conspiracies. These conspiracies have websites. That's how I know about the rules of the AACS conspiracy. I looked at their website. They admit these conspiracies. A conspiracy to restrict the public's access to technology ought to be a felony, just like a conspiracy to fix prices. After all, controlling what our technology does is a worse attack on us than controlling prices. It ought to be treated as a more grave crime. But there's no danger that that, to them, that that will happen unless we can manage to restore democracy and eliminate corporatocracy. <clears throat> and now, their latest idea, which they've implemented in several countries, is to disconnect people from the internet when they are accused of sharing. And because it would be too much trouble to have a real trial for these people, they decide not to have real trials. Uh, they will stop at nothing to crush cooperation in society, to isolate people from each other, Whatever gets in their way, they will crush even basic principles of justice, such as no punishment without a trial. Now, the US has, in fact, abandoned that, that principle already. 
There is civil forfeiture where people's property can be seized without convicting them of a crime. And then there's the practice of administratively declaring a group to be terrorist without holding a trial to prove that it really is, and then punishing everybody connected with it. This violates freedom of association. It's tyranny. So I guess the idea of a little bit more tyranny uh, punishing people on association, on accusation of sharing, doesn't bother them. And now the US is proposing to abolish internet domains and restrict the internet in other ways, again, on mere accusation without a trial. And that leads to the last of these threats I want to mention, precarity. Whatever you're doing on the internet, you can't say that you have a right to do it. You do it on sufferance. You can buy something to print and you can print copies of a pamphlet and go on the street and hand them out. You don't need to convince somebody to cooperate with the publication of that pamphlet. But to do the corresponding distribution on the internet, you do. If you want to have a website, you're going to need the cooperation of a, a domain name registrar and an ISP, and maybe, and most often, also some kind of co-location service. And every one of them will say that they can cancel your contract for any reason. So what happens? Your use of the internet is precarious. What brought this home was the US dirty tricks campaign against WikiLeaks. The US unofficially, uh, secretly, tried to drive WikiLeaks off the internet and tried to drive it out of e-commerce by going privately to various companies whose cooperation they needed and convincing those companies, probably with some Im implied threat, that they would lose money if they didn't arbitrarily refuse to deal with WikiLeaks. <coughs> Imagine if the telephone company could be convinced that it was in its interest to stop giving you phone service. Imagine if the electric company could be convinced that it would gain something if it cut off your electric service. That's what precarity of use is. You don't even have the right to keep paying to have an internet connection because it can be cut off arbitrarily. Now, this means that the internet is a world where we have no rights. It didn't matter so much in the past because they weren't so set up to take advantage of this against us. Things were not as solidly, tightly organized. But now, with the Dirty Tricks campaign against WikiLeaks, we see what's going on. Anyone who upsets the apple cart enough is likely to be the victim of this kind of dirty tricks campaign. And of course, a bunch of internet protesters called Anonymous responded to, the, to this denial of service attack against WikiLeaks by launching uh, basically mass participation denial of service attacks against the websites of the companies that had participated in the denial of service attack against WikiLeaks, which I think is perfect justice, except it wasn't really as bad as 
you know, the punishment wasn't as bad as the crime. So uh, it didn't really do the job. But uh, wouldn't you know, police have arrested the participants in the, uh, in the mass denial of service attack, but no prosecution has been made against Amazon or PayPal or MasterCard or Visa or Bank of America or the other companies that participated in the denial of service attack against WikiLeaks. And I think we need to prohibit that, that kind of denial of service. We need to require that once you sign up for some kind of internet service plan, that you can't be disconnected as long as you pay in accord with the rules of the plan that are the same as apply to everyone else in it. And they also must not be allowed to adopt rules that effectively single a person out or change the rules too often so that it's hard for people to follow them. They need to be regulated in effect somewhat like other public utilities to make sure that we can count on having them available as long as we pay the standard rate. <clears throat> so those are the points I wanted to make. Now I'll be ready to answer questions, but first I want to auction this adorable GNU that needs a home for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you are the purchaser, I'll be happy to sign either the card or the body. And if you have a penguin, you need a GNU because as we all know, a penguin can't hardly do anything without a GNU except, except talk on the phone. So. If you bid, wa please wave your arm and shout the amount you're bidding. You want me to notice you. So I'm going to start at $25. Do I get 25? I've got 25. Do I get 30? <laughs> Do I get, um, I've got 30. Do I get 35? Do I get 35? How much? What? I've got 36, do I get 40? I've got 36, do I get 40? How much? 40. I've got 40, do I get 45? I've got 45, what? I can't hear you. No, I won't accept going up by just one dollar. It, it will take too long. Uh, it's, do I get 45? I've got 45, do I get 50? I've got 45, do I get 50? Do I get 50? Do I get $50 for this adorable GNU? $50, I've got 50, do I get 55? I've got 50, do I get 55? $55 for this adorable GNU that needs a home. Do I get $55 to the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom? Do I get 55? Last chance to bid 55 or more. How much? 55. I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 55. Do I get 60? Do I get 60? Do I get $60 for this adorable GNU that needs a home? $60 to the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom. Do I get 60? Last chance to bid 60 or more. Do I get 60? How much? I've got 60. Do I get 65? Do I get $65 for this adorable GNU to the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom? Last chance to bid 65 or more. Do I get 65? Last chance, do I get 65? Going, going, gone for 60. So we still have large and small buttons for sale. $2 for a small, three for a large. And we still have the copies of my book of essays, second edition that's fairly new, and the uh, semi-autobiography for $20. Questions? Um, regarding freedom of screen, the freedom of contribute to the community, one of the largest problems that the free software movement that many of us remember is that they were attacking the people who volunteered.
I don't know how to fight for that. I, I would approve of it, but you know that's outside my field. Uh, you need to talk with people who work in that field how you, and ask how you can help. But uh, if you find out, if you find a URL of recommendations for what people should do, please send it to me and I'll post a link to it. EqualityTrust.org. Email it to me, so because I'll forget. I'm curious about your position on the surveillance. Um, there's, a, there's a growing segment of the population that's perfectly happy to self-surveil, but they'll point out on their Facebook page all sorts of details about their lives. I don't know what to do about it. Well, it's nuts. I'm not Maybe, but, but, well, that, ah, notice this a philosophical swindle here. Something could be changing. That doesn't mean it's outdated. Do we decide what's good and bad based on fad? You're, uh, you see, yes, there may, t there may be, there are these people who tell everything about themselves, and I suspect that in a few years they'll learn to wish they hadn't. When they start applying for jobs, when they find that they said too much about themselves, they may learn to regret it. This thing may be, may be self-correcting or maybe not. I can't see the future. What I can say is that the existence of those people doesn't tell us anything about what's good or bad. It tells us, it, you know, we see a phenomenon, something's happening. Then we can have our opinion about it. We can't deny the facts. But the facts that there are many young people who will tell the whole world everything about themselves doesn't imply anything about whether it is right for our systems to track us all the time. I didn't say that. I said, the op I said explicitly that I didn't say that. I said that there f we must be free to share. That's right. That's, that's a fact. That's not my opinion. That's a fact about law. Oh, that's a different issue. You, you didn't understand what I said. Copyright infringement is, uh, the, is a basis for a lawsuit. And in some cases, it's a crime but it's never theft. Uh, sorry, you just made a non sequitur. But in quote intellectual property, unquote, is a bogus concept. It doesn't even mean anything. It's a way of talking about a dozen different laws as if they were one issue, which they're not, because they're not similar at all. And as a result, any statement made formulated in terms of, quote, intellectual property, unquote, is pure confusion. I don't have any opinion formulated using that term because I have one set of views about copyright. I have totally different views about patent law. I have totally different views about trademark law. These laws have nothing in common. And then I have different views about plant variety monopolies and I don't have much views about publicity rights, but it's a different issue. These are all totally different issues. So anytime somebody uses the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, he's overgeneralizing in a way that makes the statement worthless. So, but you were talking about copyright, and that far what you said made some sense. So can I, res I'd like to respond to that part, because it did make, it was a sensible question. So. Uh, it's true that uh, in the U.S. the justification, the stated justification for copyright law is to promote progress. So we have not a balance but a, the opportunity of making a deal, a trade. And that's what the U.S. legal tradition considers copyright law, a trade. The public trades away part of its natural rights to get the benefit of more writing. Well, that's a real benefit. And in the age of the printing press, what we traded away was freedoms that we were unable to exercise. So it was a beneficial trade in the age of the printing press. 
Well, now, some of it may still be beneficial. You'll note that I'm not saying we should abolish copyright. What I'm saying is, though, that we have to uh, reduce the strength of copyright in a certain spot because the freedom to share is essential. Now, legalizing sharing does not abolish copyright because copyright would still cover modification and commercial use. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, I believe Kaza involved using a proprietary program, and you should never do that. But file sharing, of course, should be legalized of published works. Yes, it's good. Sharing is good. Well, wait, wait, wait. I'm not interested in the music producer, but I am interested in the musicians. Okay, the music. Okay, well, the system of copyright works really badly for artists. It gives, it's a sort of trickle down where a lot goes to the companies and a little trickles down to most of the artists and then there are a few superstars who are treated very nicely. And whenever they, there's a hearing in Congress and the publishers say you've got to increase copyright power for the sake of those creators and I think it's no coincidence that they use the same word that sometimes is used for a deity. Uh, and then they bring out some superstar creators who say yeah, also, yes, we need more copyright power. And we're supposed to believe that this means it's good for artists in general. But that's bullshit. Uh, so uh, if we want to help artists, we should do it in a way that really helps artists. So I have two ways to suggest. One is through taxation. We can use public money, perhaps from the general budget or perhaps through a special tax, and we can distribute this money to artists based on their popularity, which is after all what copyright does, or at least is supposed to do, when the publishers don't take all that money away from them, but not in linear proportion. This is crucial. Just as we want, just as a proper income tax would be progressive. Ours isn't anymore, really. But the idea was it would look like this. As you made more money, you would pay a, a bigger fraction of it because you could afford to pay a bigger fraction of it if you're rich. Uh, so a government subsidy should taper off. As your popularity increases, you should get more money, but it shouldn't rise so fast anymore. So I suggest using the cube root. It's a pretty good function for this. It's not the only one that's pr right, you know. Uh, any power in, in that range might be reasonable. The point is, with the cube root, if superstar A is a thousand times as popular as fairly successful artist B, a will get 10 times as much money as B. Not a thousand times as much, but 10 times as much. So the result is, with this system, we would adequately support a larger number of fairly popular artists. The system would do the same job as copyright, but would do it better and more efficiently. With less money, we would support artists more. The other way is by voluntary payments. If each Pay player had a button to anonymously send a dollar to the artist that made this particular work or the last one I watched, a lot of people would push it because after all a dollar is not that much and uh, you can easily send a dollar to somebody and you wouldn't miss it. Make it brief because other people have questions too. Right. Right. 
what you do is you ask for various kinds of donations. It's working already. You thank you say, great, they're interested. Oh, well, I'll tell you how it works. Remember, if you're a, unless you're a superstar, you weren't going to get any money for that record, except for a small advance at the beginning. So sales of the record don't do you any good at all. But fans, you have various ways to make money from, like selling stuff at your concerts, like selling stuff through a website. If people love your music, they're going to want to buy things from you. That's the only way musicians make money now unless they're superstars. And in fact, not just superstars, but long established superstars who have already finished their first contract. That's the way it already works. Right. Yes, all. Yes. They say so. You're, you're free to copy this. And if it's inconvenient to Xerox the pages, you can download the file and print that. Is there, I can't hear all the words you say. Some of your consonants I can't recognize. En français, peut-être? Well, first of all, free software is absolutely essential to ensure you control what your computer is doing. Without free software, you do not control that. However, just controlling what your own computer is doing is not a total protection. Because if your ISP is retaining data or filtering access, you can't stop that by anything you do with your own computer. I think that people in some European countries need to start campaigning, set up services in China to respect our, where they can respect our freedom more. I pick China because of course we know China's a tyranny and doesn't allow its own citizens freedom on the internet. But I don't think China would care to censor a, a website in French talking to French people. And that's, that's what all French people must do. They've got to move their sites out of France, which has a law demanding that all s internet services record lots of information about their users. Well, everybody's got to move his inter internet service to China where the French government won't be able to get any information from those services anymore. Um, I want a society in which there is no proprietary software. As for whether it should be illegal, I wouldn't propose to prohibit it now. Uh, in general, if there's a if there's a harmful practice that a lot of people want to do, prohibiting it is not a good idea. Uh, but if someday people generally recognize that proprietary software is bad, it might be legitimate to prohibit distribution of proprietary software, which, uh, of course, it should never be, people should never be punished for having it or using it in any case. But I'd like to get rid of that practice. And what's the best right way to get rid of a practice? Well, banning it entirely when a lot of people still think it's OK is obviously not a good thing. Trademarks are basically a good thing. However, we now see trademark law being twisted to the point where companies say, demand to be entitled to use their brands because of all the money they spent promoting them. For instance, Australia is talking about requiring cigarettes to be sold in very plain packages 
with the name of the product written in a standard typeface and some horrible pictures of people who've been ill from smoking uh, over the pack. Uh, and the tobacco companies are saying that this is illegal because it takes away their brands. Well, it doesn't actually literally take them away. It just says they can't use them in this context. But uh, if there is any validity to what they are saying, that's absolute tyranny. But I certainly don't want to abolish trademarks. Well, actually, that's probably intimidation. Uh, it's normal to have the same brands be in use in different fields of business. Uh, these people, there's a lot of intimidation going on with trademarks, and perhaps there needs to be punishment for for attempts to uh, intimidate people that are not justified by trademark law. Uh, you need a lawyer, but uh, uh, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know the facts of your case, but I would guess that they probably don't have a leg to stand on. Well, I hope you'll buy some free software and support the developers. And you can also buy our buttons and books and so on and support the FSF. You can join the FSF. And that's an important thing. You can go to fsf.org and become a member of the FSF and support our work. If you want to pay dues in person here you, today, you can do that too. I've got some cards you can fill out. Yes, you can. Well, not only that, it's, you control it to a certain extent, but once other people look at that page, they can save it, you know. So you can't stop it. You know, once you publish it, you've got to assume it's going to get around. You can't expect it to disappear. Well, I don't suppose there's any law against uh, giving, stating false travel plans on your website. Yeah. I've heard of that cause. It's, I think it's actually a matter of owning a set of page numbers that, that they assigned to uh, the published uh, cases for citations, page numbers and line numbers. And yeah, I mean, uh, what, the court system should be set up so that it doesn't demand people use or doesn't even pressure people or encourage people to use any particular private set of indexing that isn't uh, available to everyone. This will have to be the last question. I don't know whether that's actually feasible. I can't imagine how you could do that. 
it, I don't know, but in any case, I don't think that it's possible to do that with cell phones. I can't see how, but I'm not a super expert on them. You'd have to talk to someone else, I'm sorry. Well, with searching, there is a way. You can use a search engine without identifying yourself to it, without contacting it directly so that it doesn't get your IP number. And that way, uh, the, the search engine won't know who's asking and won't be able to collect any data about you. And you should do that. And, by, and if you use a map engine, you shouldn't put in any addresses. Why should it know what address you're interested in? When I look at them, I look at a certain part of the city. I see the place I'm interested in. The server doesn't know what place I'm interested in. Uh, at this point, I know we have to stop. At least I was told we had to stop at, at 2. Can we continue? Is there anyone here who's in charge? Yes, you can continue to Oh, really? Oh, good. Oh, good. I didn't think that we'd be able, oh, good, so fine, we can have as many questions as you like. Uh, and did we, did you ever get another call f from Dennis Allison? I have voicemail, but the signal is bad. So okay, try. Yeah. And they said that they sent the package, but it's not coming in straight back. Oh. What would you like? Oh, all right, I see, okay. And do you need, do you need to leave now? If you want me to sign it, I'll sign it now. Where do you do you want me to sign the card? You can see it better, but the body. A lot of people prefer the body anyway. Okay, which one is this one? Okay. Yeah, my word. Sorry. So, who are you? Okay. Can you? Okay. Yes. Those are $20 each, and feel free to take a look. Thank you. So what would you like? OK. Hello, Richard. Do you remember me? No. No? That's fine. 